introduce you to our speaker, Peter John, who is an expert on RCTs, experiments and trials, and he will distinguish for you which is which and what the difference is. But this is one of our talks explaining what a method is. And I was saying to some people before, we're recording this, but we're not going to record the discussion. So you can be perfectly happy that you can ask anything, and there will be time for discussion before we end, or pause at questions. So you can be happy you should ask questions before, without being recorded. So um, we're very pleased to have Peter here. Um, uh, he's explained where he comes from, and I'll sort of leave him to say more about himself. So I'll just hand over to you, Peter. Well, I don't regard myself as an expert on experiments, on environmental problems. I hope I'm becoming one. I think what I regard myself is an enthusiast for them, and I've actually become very excited by experiments and what they can deliver for social science. And hopefully, some of that enthusiasm which I've got, uh, well, perhaps you're already enthusiastic about experiments, so I don't need to enthuse you, uh, but hopefully some of the um, enthusiasm should, should, should hopefully will, will come across in what I've got to say. And I think that experiments, and in some sense I've always worked mainly with qualitative or quantitative survey-based research or aggregate-based research, so I'm actually new to experiments. I got into them when I came to Manchester. Um, and it's partly, I got into them partly from the frustrations of sometimes with some quantitative work and actually really knowing whether you've really found something out, whether you've actually made an inference or not. And, a, and with experiments, offer a much cleaner, tidier, more authoritative way of testing out interventions and things you can do. Now, obviously, there are complications with experiments. There are with all the methods you've been, you've been listening to over the last few weeks. Um, but in its pure form, randomized controlled trials do have this kind of strong uh, advantage. And in my field, I'm, I'm a political scientist, they hardly ever really appear. They were around the 1920s. Most of our work is mainly on survey data, aggregate data, but it's been this recent rediscovery of experiments particularly on voting studies. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the voting studies we've done. And there's this new kind of excitement that's suddenly bubbling around. And everybody's getting into experiments, there's a new network. Um, so I think it's something we find ex exciting. Obviously in some fields, I've been doing experiments for a very long time. Uh, but we, in politics, uh, have come across them. So, start off, I think, with... In fact, it is a, polit a political problem. Um, just a kind of hypothetical problem. Um, so that's what you think about this. So a team of researchers wants to find out whether doorstall canvassing, i.e. basically people going around knocking on doors, has effect on voter turnout, i.e. people, when they go to the polls, they actually are, are whether they vote or not. Not for any political party or not, but just whether they actually vote uh, or not. So in order to find out, so they wanted to find out, well, does this actually work? If you, if you door knock, can you actually get people to turn out? And you think that's quite a plausible thing to happen. So it's not an unrealistic uh, thing, thing to find out. So they survey a random sample of electors and ask whether they were, they were canvassed uh, uh, or not. So they have a record whether they canvassed or not, say yes or no. Um, and then they found out whether they, you can actually find out if people voted from electoral registers. Um, and then you correlate whether they canvass with whether they were voted. And basically, obviously, they found that you know the, the ones which are more likely to be uh, canvassed were the ones more likely to uh, have voted. And then they sort of claim, well, maybe as a result of this, canvassing sort of increases uh, voter turnout. So, are they right? No. What also is going on <coughs> with with what you're observing with with people being is 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 people who are getting the campus, is that so something which is, um, I mean, why, why, why would, you know, in a sense, if, why would, if you've contacted somebody to campus them, why, in a sense, is that a kind of neutral sort of thing? Do people actually, um, do you contact a kind of random sample of a population when you kind of count somebody? No. Well, of course, I'm starting questions, aren't I? You know where I'm going, don't you? Um, but obviously, when you canvass, when, let's say, let's say people kind of canvass, you know, parties try and get the voters to turn out. They often select the people who are most likely to kind of turn out. Um, so there's this problem which is called selection problem that people are selected. And this kind of may actually create a kind of bias 
in what you're looking at, effectively you may actually see a kind of false correlation uh, between those two. So can you get around this problem? Well, one is you can basically do a regression approach. You just control for everything. You basically kind of put all usual suspects and find out. So basically you control for everything that causes turnout. And then maybe you find whether being contacted or not in your survey might predict those it's turnout. It's respectable. Well, I'm sure you've had, I'm not going to knock regression analysis. Uh, and a lot of it comes into experiments too. Uh, another thing that's more complicated is you do this kind of, kind of two-stage approach. You treat canvassing as endogenous, that it's not something which is um, so independent. And there's a technique in economics called two-stage three squares regression. You, create, you find an instrument to try and create an unbiased estimate at the second stage. That's, again, very respectable. The problem is trying to find some instrument to uh, create your unbiased effect. So basically... In a lot of social processes, it's actually quite hard when you look at the observed data to actually know whether you can actually make that kind of causal inference. And the great thing about experiments is they actually do allow you, in principle, to do that. So I talked a little bit about experiments, and this actually goes back to my other talk, which was the bigger talk, uh, all about uh, experiments. And in a sense, we're talking about a large class of things, which really are where a researcher manipulates a variable of interest to see if it causes an outcome. So effectively, um, what you're interested in is rather than just observing things in the real world, you're actually interested in actually doing something and seeing whether what you do actually leads to the actual canvas. So rather than just observing canvassing, what happens if you actually did the canvassing yourself or cooperated with somebody and then try and find out what actually happened as a result of what you're doing? And the idea is what you're doing is you're trying to take a bit more control over the proceedings so you can actually then identify the causal uh, effects. And it's various different, 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 different ways. And obviously, in science, they've got complete control over the environment where you, whereby you kind of manipulate your thing. So you can manipulate your kind of, and I'm not kind of a scientist, but what I think scientists do, they manipulate things in labs and they can then sort of work out you know, whether something caused uh, uh, something. In social science, we can't have that degree of control over, su over subjects, um, partly for ethical reasons. And, you know, and in some sense, you can't really kind of stare inside somebody's brain to kind of be worked out. Well, perhaps you can, but I don't, I don't know of much research, such in politics, that actually does that. Um, so in the end, what you actually want to be able to do is manipulate, but also manipulate and compare. And classically, what we do in experiments is we manipulate one group, which gets us on a treatment, gets something, and then we compare it to a group that doesn't. Um, now, and I think the kind of trick is that the people who do who get and do not get the experiment uh, get, are in those groups by chance, i.e. they're randomly allocated into those, into those kind of groups. And the basic, the basic uh, advantage is that if you randomly allocate them into those kind of groups, then if you observe a difference in the outcomes at the end of your experiment, then other things being equal... It's not dark, isn't it? Oh, that's because I'm not moving around enough. Is this a sort of teacher correction thing? <laughs> <laughs> we all have to break our hands. <laughs> that's right, OK. It's quite light anyway. It's so interesting. Um, so, uh, so in a sense, you, it, any difference should be really attributable to, to, to the treatment. Uh, because you've randomly allocated it. Now, how you allocate now is you do have different kinds of, of, of experiments. Uh, when you've got kind of natural experiments, where sometimes this kind of happens to things by chance in the environment, as the certain things get randomly allocated, a particular kind of group gets something that another, you know, another group doesn't get, and it's just purely random. And these things just happen kind of naturally. And, it's, and there's a lot of interest in natural experiments, particularly by economists and others. Um, but I think they often tend to be quite rare, and sometimes they don't look quite as random as they first uh, appear. But there's a nice big literature about that. Um, you can have quantitative experiments, perhaps I've been a bit harsh on them. Uh, quantitative experiments where you've got low numbers, uh, where, and in a sense it's a little bit more like the actual the scientific experiment, where you're actually looking at the kind of close internal kind of process and you're trying to manipulate them and look at those kind of calls or, or, or relations. And it can be really useful in the early phases of randomized control trial, and, and perhaps of mixing 
uh, randomized control trial uh, and those uh, uh, methods. There are other kinds of techniques which are quite similar to experiments. One is this thing called regression discontinuity analysis, which is very kind of trendy uh, in economics, at least was, I mean, maybe, I mean economists, economists move so fast, this is probably trendy about 15 years ago. Uh, it's quite trendy in political science at the moment. I think quite a few studies published using RTP designs. And that's where you get a kind of artificial kind of cutoff, often in a kind of treated, in a kind of population getting something like benefits, some sort of cutoff point, where your people are eligible and at some point they're not eligible. And, they're, and the secret of RDD designs is to use regression using that kind of cutoff point. Because basically, if you're either side of that kind of cutoff point, it's a bit like you've been randomly allocated. So there's been two categories, and that can be used in, in that. The other, and in some senses, RDDs are an example of what Tom Cook, uh, a famous uh, social statistician from Northwestern University, um, calls quasi experiments. And actually, a lot of kind of social science, a lot of regression analysis basically relies on similar kind of assumptions to, uh, to an experiment. And what Tom Cook is interested in saying was how can we look at our data to make it a little bit more like an experiment? And what kind of, what, how, can, how can we actually do that? Um, and, um, but these things all themselves are not key to what I'm going to talk about today, which is a, a randomized uh, control trial. So basically I think you should think of experiments as a kind of big heading of all these, thing, all these kind of manipulations, and then randomized control trial as a subset of those uh, experiments. And probably the one which is most kind of common, commonly applied, at least in social sciences. Um, and so it's a special kind of, and this, as some says, I've already explained it uh, a little bit. So you could have two or more groups, and they're basically compared to the um, treatment group, or control group, sorry. And you don't have, in a sense, you don't have to have just, just two groups. Often you have USA, one, you actually have several treatment groups. I'll talk about this a bit later. At least it's kind of quite interesting uh, designs. And basically, this is what I said before, you basically uh, randomize, and the randomization basically allows you to create that unbiased estimate. The other thing that's characteristic of RCTs is you need to be able to do, to carry out in advance, some sort of estimate of what you think is actually going to happen in the experiment. Because obviously, you don't want to suddenly just say, okay, I'm going to test those turnout, and like, I'll just go to 100 households, and then I'll go back and I'll find out whether there's a difference between the treatment and the health. And then you find out, well, uh, you know, you, have, you, know, it's, it, you, know, you may have difference between treatment and control groups. They may be just be kind of by chance. So in actual fact, what you want in RCTs is sufficient numbers whereby that you're a reasonably capable of observing um, uh, an inference. And this is often done by what's called power analysis, whereby you actually hypothesize in advance what kind of effect size you're likely to get. Um, so let's say we think that we think that voter turnout is likely to increase by 3% as a result of our counts. If you have us on the door of, 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 of your treatment group, they only have a 3% higher turnout than the people are going to turn out anyway without that intervention. So then you can basically say, well, if it's going to be 3%, how many numbers will I need in my experiment to just take that to take that? So that's why randomized control trials tend to be uh, in the in the high hundreds, thousands, rather than the kind of tens and twenties, you need reasonably large numbers. But you can calculate what you expect uh, in advance. The other crucial thing about uh, randomized control trials is that you need uh, measurement uh, after the intervention of the actual outcomes you were interested in. It may sound obvious, but that's why you need to actually have a really reliable measure uh, of that. I mentioned the voter turnout example. Um, now we know we can use surveys to generate um, uh, estimates of voter turnout. But if we do a door-to-door -door survey, um, basically, if you ask people who voted in a local election, you can get something like 60% of people will say they voted in a local election. And we know that only about 25% of people actually do turn out. So 30% of people in that say that's one of the not saying the truth, they, they misremember things. But we do have access to the actual electoral registers, which actually tell us whether people voted uh, or, or not. So 
you need that kind of accurate measure. It may also be useful to actually measure before the intervention. It's not actually strictly necessary, but it's actually very useful to actually have a measurement of what, what the actual turnout or what the actual outcome was before the actual intervention. Um, and so the classic RCT kind of looks something like something like this. Um, you know, you basically start your study by selecting your kind of population. Um, and then the key thing is you randomize into these two, these two kind of groups. Um, and obviously you can do randomization in various kinds of ways. You can basically take every other respondent on the actual register. There's various programs on Excel or SPSS, just kind of randomize uh, subjects. It's routine sort of stuff. And then basically, you basically work, 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 sort of work out exactly whether these outcomes are, are actually observed. And obviously, if the outcome of the intervention group is higher, well, what the hypothesis is, of course, the hypothesis could be that it's lower. You know, maybe, maybe there's a sort of thing that you want to... I, mean, I, 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 I can't think of a research project really getting funded that you want to reduce turnout. Uh, it might not get passed uh, an ethics committee, and more of those ethics committees... Uh, later, but there may be some projects where you know it, it, it may actually be less. That's what your hypothesis is when you start off. But basically, particularly if, if you take a voting sample, you find that well, are they actually voting more in that group? And then you can compare and contrast uh, those two uh, results, and you can do a statistical test to see whether the difference you've observed is actually something which has just happened by chance, where it actually is real. So you do a, a kind of t-test between those two. Samples. There are more sophisticated ways of analysing your data. Talk about regression again. You can do regression analysis uh, using your outcome variable as a dependent variable, and then your treatment variable becomes one of the independent variables. Okay, so um, you can do different kinds of uh, trials. Um, you can do sort of basically. I mean, one of the, one of the one of the issues about trials is the natural fact, as I perhaps alluded to, uh, I think in social science is not so much of a problem because uh, I think we, we tend to just there isn't a kind of history of um, people. I think the war is just to just find out whether it works or not, um, and there's less costs associated with that kind of negative uh, result. Um, but in the in the health, because obviously a lot of these things are used to test drugs in, in a variety of kind of treatments. Um, so basically, you have a whole series of procedures to ensure that the people doing this trial actually don't actually know who is actually in the treatment control. And that can be the, the researcher, uh, and that also has some, this is where the subject is in a, in a, in a treatment control group can be uh, important uh, or not. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if people know they've been kind of treated, like they're getting one particular kind of intervention and not another, um, but it's quite hard to actually kind of discourage that. And then basically whether the actual people analysing the data actually knows that kind of application. The other features of RCTs, um, they can be labs, sorry I should have started that out, labs should be sort of laboratory or field uh, examples, so they can either be in a lab setting, which is maybe a little bit like this, say in front of computers, uh, and psychopath. So psychologists like to do those kinds of experiments, a lot of economists do them. Uh, experiments which I like are the ones which are actually in the field, actually the so called uh, real world, where you're actually trying to actually mimic what would actually really actually happen uh, in a kind of real world process. RCTs can be quite complicated, lots of, lots of different treatments, lots of different stages. I mentioned about that, you know, said you might get somebody else to randomize them. Another thing, as I mentioned, is that ethical approval is more complicated in randomized control trials, uh, because obviously if you're doing something to a subject, it's something ethics committees may be actually more interested in things like um, consent forms uh, and the actual conduct of that trial than maybe just a more standard kind of technique. There are particular sets of procedures for carrying them out. A lot of the ones we talked about, double blinding, um, Actually cap captured by these proceedings called consort, which is a um, I don't know if that kind of stands, but actually, um, but so that basically there are kind of internationally recognised standards for carrying these uh, things out. 
I mean, one of the key points about random and controlled trials is because they're such a gold standard, in some ways you actually have to be even more kind of careful uh, with, those, with, those kind of, with those kind of results. Uh, because once they get out there, then everybody will accept them as being one kind of face uh, thing. Um, I had a wonderful example uh, of a statistician with, with Sarah uh, this morning, uh, an example of the boots. Have you come across the boots anti-aging cream? Um, I didn't know this story before. And apparently there's this boots anti-aging cream. Uh, there was a randomized control trial done by it, which reported that it had to have strong effects on um, reducing wrinkles. And this was released into the uh, pocket sphere of reporting um, in newspapers uh, on it. And, um, and apparently boots made a vast amount of money out of it. So they apparently they worked out of this trial showing this result. They stopped their warehouses full of this group. And they must have made actually millions of them. When the trial was actually being looked at, apparently the um, the actual trial was actually carried out in Manchester, but it was actually carried out quite properly in terms of the actual procedures of the trial. It was analysed properly. But when the trial actually was reported um, uh, more publicly, when it was kind of written up more publicly, uh, the way it was written up perhaps gave a slightly misleading impression on the uh, impact of the group. And of course, because it's about much popular, people are right, but it must be true. So in some senses, you know, in a sense, the very advantages of the Rampart control trial can actually be a source of all of our problem. Okay. And there has been some correspondence, I think, in the in leading journals, actually, uh, about this group's study. Um, we'll do placebo. I'm going to move a bit faster, because I think I'm going a bit, a bit too slowly. So um, I might come back to uh, some of these. And... <laughs> Just talking about an example, um, and I think one of the great things about randomized control trials is they can correct um, conventional wisdom. Basically, it's quite common you might have a, a whole line of observational research which seems to show one finding, but when the randomized control comes along, it actually finds that the actual the, the opposite is going on. And the, the reasons for that have something to do with perhaps the tendency of some research methods to overemphasize the success of interventions. We mentioned the kind of selection effect earlier, right at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, but, I mean, there's other ways in which various kind of studies, like before and after studies, survey-based studies, can actually overestimate the impact of interventions. Uh, this is an intervention, um, I mean, it's a whole series of trials, actually, Basically, it was evaluating uh, an intervention, a, a, a kind of criminological intervention, whereby um, young offenders, the idea was that a young offender, if they actually had exposure to somebody who was in long-term incarceration, uh, this would actually uh, effectively be a kind of correction to them, kind of scare them, uh, that actually, fact, you know, this is that what way you kind of personally uh, would like to uh, end up. The result of that might actually mean that might be less likely to uh, re-offend and basically a whole series of trials were done on this. And apparently, basically what happens when you actually analyze the trials, and I think the thing about trials is often you need to do quite a few of them to generate results. So they actually pulled all these results. And they actually found that the scared straight uh, program actually increased uh, repentance. And that's the opposite effect uh, of what was uh, intending. So in some sense, it's for, from a policy-making point of view, this is actually quite important because actually these programs are now being overthrown from all you, these is, is, is all US studies uh, from US prisons. So, you know, in some sense, these randomized control trials can actually be, as they're a kind of powerful, warrantable form of knowledge, can be a powerful tool for policymakers. What they find slightly harder to do is actually find out, well, why this is actually happening, why was it actually? Because sometimes in the experiment, you can observe the difference it doesn't quite tell you what, what actually is going on in that kind of black box. Um, I think we probably have, to, I mean, in this one, I think two things could be going on. One is that maybe some sort of information has been kind of picked up. Uh, and that there's a sense of people actually, uh, by exposure to prisoners, are kind of picking up some sort of set information. Maybe they find the uh, lifestyle maybe attractive, maybe some peer effect. <laughs> or perhaps it may be some sort of anticipatory uh, socialization that people are effectively kind of being kind of pre socialized. 
uh, into a kind of microcrime by actually seeing you know, what, what they may actually uh, become. I think that's a species of socialization. It's kind of it's when people, before they actually do something, they actually then take on the kind of attributes and behaviors of it. I mean, there's an example whereby is if people are selected from a kind of posh school, uh, in the school holidays before they go, they kind of start wearing the kind of school uniforms and trying it out and that sort of thing. Um, so that's happening. Okay, so I'm going to crack on. In social sciences, uh, you've got um, sort of the health trials at the um, lots of Lots of clustering. Education is a recent area of it, it, expansion. Lots of, lots of RCTs done in employment welfare interventions. That's kind of a big area, particularly in the US, sometimes in the UK. Okay. Crime, obviously, is quite a big area. I mentioned some of those. Um, and not much in political science uh, until uh, recently. And um, the uh, so main pioneer has been these voting experiments, mainly done in the US by uh, John Green and Alan Gerber. And, um, and things that start in America often end up, often end up sort of in Britain. Um, and basically talk about an example which, which I did um, in, when I first came to Manchester, in fact. I came to Manchester in 2004 and uh, sort of dived into experiments with uh, uh, sort of world abandon, as it were, uh, and basically decided, well, there's a general election coming up. Couldn't we sort of raise turnout uh, in, in the election through a, uh, a kind of experiment? So basically we, we chose a safe constituency within Shaw. Um, <coughs> randomly selected these voters from the electoral register who had accessible te- telephone lines. We randomised them into three groups and then we handed one to a local serving company to uh, telephone them. And then the other we then hired uh, a, a group of postgraduate uh, students um, uh, and I and uh, Tessa Brannan basically sort of coordinated a sort of team of canvassers who went out to the Detroit every day. Headquarters was the local cafe and they went round to the campus and door knocking. And then we then that's us. Yes, we can. We can. So and um, though, so basically, we kind of s- stress things like the duty to vote. It's a good idea to vote. Um, and obviously, one of the issues of this is that um, this is kind of a big issue in experiments. Is that sometimes if you think of a kind of clinical trial where you get everybody kind of in and then you randomise into two groups. Providing somebody doesn't kind of leave, uh, everybody's going to stay in the trial. The problem with a lot of political science experiments is you can't kind of force people into the experiment in the real world. So often you get sort of selection into the. So not everybody who's actually canvassed is actually treated. So we basically got about a 45% hit rate. Which is kind of what you expect, isn't it? If you go door knocking around with them, sure. Not everybody's going to be in, are they? Um, so, I mean, we did try about two, three times. And actually, I think we not got a bad response. So basically, this is what the results were. So we had this is the treatment control. So basically, we looked at the vote out in the treatment and in the control group. And it looks like that basically for the telephone group, the canvassing group, you get this kind of difference um, in, in turn out roughly, roughly, roughly the same, same uh, amount. And obviously, this is the kind of raw, uh, what's called the attention to treat uh, results. Um, and also actually get an estimate of what the impact of the intervention was. Because uh, obviously, if you go around canvassing people, you don't actually, as you can sense, is it fair to always count the people you actually didn't actually canvass? And obviously, what you don't want to do is then just only compare the people in your treatment group. But there are some statistical results whereby you can adjust the treatment effect by dividing it by the content in, um, contact rate. Which actually is a form of two squares, least squares, the estimation, which is from where I actually started. And so basically, what randomization is doing is providing the perfect instrument. And so basically, as a result of that, we estimated basically a kind of 7%, roughly about 7% treatment um, effect for the uh, experiment. Actually, low power. So yeah, essentially, it's a quite small scale experiment. So just generalize that low. But uh, quite interesting that, I mean, the, the, the thing about studying was we expected the, the counting effect that if you were knocked up, you know, basically something goes and you, you actually meet somebody face to face, we thought that would be a stronger effect than somebody kind of telephoning 
you're up because you know when you feel at home, you know you hear the telephone calls and somebody's telling you to do something you don't like it. So you come to the door and they smile and you live in Manchester, you think, oh yeah, that's nice, I'll go for it. We actually found you can stand up that stuff. So that's that was quite good. Um, RCT is not the new uh, Nirvana. Um, and my joke is that's not a heavy metal group, but let me, uh-huh. let me laugh at that one. Oh, it's pretty good laugh. <laughs> oh dear. Um, so, so what you've had so far is like RCT is absolutely wonderful. They're so exciting. You've got to go there. You're going to do top level social science. You're going to influence policy. You're going to, it's going to be fantastic. You're going to publish in great journals. You get sort of candid to your results. And I would be wrong to just say that. There are, right about doing trials is actually not that straightforward. In fact, it's actually more difficult than conventional research. It's more difficult because in conventional research, you just, you have to actually get, just get the data, survey somebody, find some electoral registers. With experiments, you've got to do all that. You've also actually got to do the intervention at the same time. You're actually doing two. It's double trouble. Um, so there's all sorts of things that happen. Even randomization actually doesn't, it's not a perfect solution, you get kind of odd, odd randomizations. Um, think, this often happens, things can happen in the field that can validate uh, an experiment. Often you can't control what goes on in the world. So, you know, for some, you know, in within Shaw, we knew actually that the parties were not going to go within Shaw because the Labour Party's given up safe constituencies. That's why we chose it. But the Labour Party could have suddenly said, right, we're going to kind of get that just out of within Shaw and just just pile in all these people uh, and would have wrecked experiments. Well, not completely wrecked it, actually. But probably wrecked it. Um, other things, sometimes control and treatment make contacts off an issue, which are actually in the real world, um, so you get a contamination issue. One of the things that often happens is not so much in clinical science trials, but the control group seems to emulate the treatment group, so you get this kind of effect where the control group does better than the treatment group. It's going to be a bit depressing uh, if you're evaluating something. Thought it takes the treatment, so how do you estimate the treatment effect? That's kind of a big, big issue. I only presented a kind of a solution to that, but there are far more advanced digital solutions, a big debate about that, um, so the various assumptions. And the problem is that the more complex the, 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 the kind of corrections which you're making, and assumptions you're making, the more you're kind of transporting experiments back into the more conventional progression world. It's much like experiment, the analysis of experiments, in the end, it doesn't look so much different to the kind of world you're trying to uh, escape from. I mentioned about ethics committees. Um, I think my whole the, the program, which myself and Sarah involved, got completely shut out. The whole thing was shut out the first stage. Um, um, I think over the years I've now learned how to do this. In particular, Sarah's influence was with me and one of the colleagues. We, we've learned how to do these. This is really rather difficult. I mean, often you, like, you want to get somebody else to randomise on your behalf. And um, you have to persuade them to, or at least you've got somebody who can go along with your randomization strategy. With, 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 with the voters, we, it's just us, we can just go out there. But you want to do other kind of things. Um, like, for example, that um, uh, scare straight program, you actually have to get the cooperation of all the prisons, the criminal justice systems to actually do it. So, a lot of, and, and, and lots of practitioners find randomization quite a hard concept uh, to uh, get to grips with. They don't like it because they don't like the idea that one group will get something another group won't, uh, despite the fact that the whole real world is full of those examples through things like postcode lotteries, various kinds of um, pilots and various sorts of things. Um, I'm going to sort of end on a kind of self-promotion, well I've done a bit of self-promotion already actually, so I might as well kind of go for it. Um, uh, this is a research program which, which, which I was talking about um, as, as, as what we've been saying, it's actually coming to an end now, we've been doing it on our, our experiments. Is a, co- is a collaboration between Manchester and here. Uh, the key thing to note is our, is our kind of website, so please have a look at what we're doing. Um, these are some experiments we've been doing. Um, one is to see whether canvassing actually works for recycling your, your waste. We've got an online deliberation experiment, seeing whether if you debate issues, you're likely to kind of shift uh, opinions. It's quite controversial at work, isn't it? on subjects where youth have social behaviour and community, community uh, cohesion, uh, i.e. racial diversity in neighbourhoods. We've got another one looking at the phenomenon of e-petitions and whether the information people see when they, when they actually petition. 
actually affects all of them. Uh, side those petitions. And we've got a recycling experiment to see whether feedback on uh, uh, smileys increases participation. Um, one of the Sarah's experiments is whether pledging increases donations. So whether you, if you pledge to do something, um, um, that means you're more likely to actually do it. What we're interested in is kind of these kind of civic behaviours uh, and how can we actually encourage them. Um, and then we've got one of a slightly different kind of one is whether the message you send as a, as a, as a if, you, if you lobby a councillor or actually the message actually has a, has a differential impact. So we have this lobbying experiment. Um, and then there's the current in Southampton we've not finished yet, which is, which is about uh, asking people to sign for uh, donations and sort of different kind of opt-outs sort of things. Um, links to further information. Um, there's a really good book, um, which is by um, um, David and Carol Torgerson, called Design Randomized Control Trials. Very straightforward to read, lots of examples. The, um, the consult strategy is available uh, online. Uh, the the Torgerson book is actually linked to um, the Charles Unit at the University of York, and it's a lot of contact with them, and they're um, a uh, very useful kind of source. Uh, of information. Uh, another website is the, um, uh, sc- uh, the School of Policy Studies at Yale, uh, which has hatched out all the voting uh, experiments um, and a whole series of other kind of participation events. So if you're really interested in kind of political science experiments, that website has a whole series of uh, stuff. Like I should also mention actually um, Don Green and Alan Gerber's book, We'll Get Out of Vote, which is like a summary of all the, all the studies. Thank you.